Welcome to the continuing series of videos on the analysis of parallel cord trusses. This particular video is taken from chapter 7, section 1, subsection 7, and will focus on trusses with rectangular bays. And in particular, we will analyze a simple span 18 bay truss with rectangular bays each bay being 12 feet on the horizontal and 9 feet vertically. So we'll take an 18 bay rectangular bay truss parallel cord, a 1P force on all the interior vertices on the top cord, and a 0.5P force at the two end vertices. The depth of the truss will be 9 feet, the spacing of the joints will be 12 feet. There are 18 bays, one P force per bay. In other words, 18 P downward force, which is equilibrated by a nine P reaction at each end of the truss. So if we zoom in on the truss, it looks like this. Nine vertical, 12 feet horizontal. Um, the slope will be four to three and that will set the proportions not only of the web members but also the proportions of the coordinate of the uh, components of the forces along these diagonals. Now I've drawn in a bunch of forces here and I am kind of hesitant to do this because I've told you go joint by joint don't make up a bunch of rules along the way and make sure you go always by fundamentals but one of the things I know by now is that if I have vertical webs with diagonals going in this direction in a simple span configuration the diagonals are going to be in tension and the verticals are going to be in compression so I've gone ahead and drawn those forces in here because I'm lazy and I just want to get that issue out of the way. Um, you need to decide whether you want to do that or not. Um, just remember there's an extremely limited number of trusses on which you can do things like this. So you need to be careful. We also know by now that we're going to have compression in the top cord and tension in the bottom cord. So I went ahead and drew those forces to get that out of the way. So if I go look at the equilibrium of this joint, I have a 9P reaction upward. To keep that joint in equilibrium, I have to have a 9P downward force, which is supplied by this vertical member. So the vertical member is pushing down on the joint. The joint is pushing up on the member, causing the member to go into compression, and it transfers that force up to this joint. And this joint is pushing down on the member. Uh, to go back to this joint for a moment, we need to resolve the horizontals. We see there are no applied horizontal forces and no reactions that are horizontal. Therefore, we know this member cannot be exerting a force on that joint. So I've simply drawn a line here indicating that I've resolved that member relative to this joint. And it has zero force. So rather than put an arrow, we just put a line that represents an arrow without an arrowhead, meaning there is no direction to the force because it is zero force. All right, so this member is 9P in compression. It's pushing upward on this joint. There is a 0.5P force downward. The only member at this joint that can equilibrate the net force of 8.5P is this diagonal. So 9P up, half P down means there's a net upward force of 8.5P, which is supplied by the vertical component of this member. So in other words, in our bookkeeping system here, we're going to put 8.5P right there. Which looks like this. And now by our proportions, Whatever this is, it needs to be four-thirds of that, or in other words, 1.3333 times that. So when we multiply that out, 
we get 11.3p for the horizontal. And we can multiply that number by 5 thirds to get this force because the proportions are 3 to 4 to 5. Those are the proportions that represent this triangle in space and they are also the same proportions that represent the components of the force in order that the net force will be along this diagonal. We can come back up to this joint now and finish resolving the horizontal forces. We have a horizontal force to the right of 11.33p, which is supplied by the tensile force in this diagonal member, which is pulling down with an 8.5p force, and to the right with an 11.33p force. This cord member is the only member that can equilibrate that force and it must be pushing on this joint to the left with an 11.33p force. There are too many unknowns at this joint to resolve, but we can jump down here where the situation is quite simple. We have one vertical component, one horizontal component. We'll resolve the vertical component first. It has to be 8.5 because this diagonal is pulling up with a vertical component of 8.5, this member must be pushing down on the joint with a force of 8.5p. That means the joint is pushing back up on the member, so the member is in a state of compression. And by the way, in the book, all these verticals are shown as a T, which is one of the errors in the book, and you should have marked that in your book already. Now we can jump up to this joint. We have one unknown vertical, which we can resolve. We have an 8.5p upward force on this joint due to the effect of this member. We have a 1p downward force, which is an applied force. That's a net 8.5p force, 7.5p upward force on this joint which will be equilibrated by having this member pulling down and to the right, and it will pull down with a force component of 7.5p on the vertical. But before I do that, I made the mistake of not finishing the resolution of this joint. So we'll do that now at this joint to resolve the horizontals. We have a horizontal component from the diagonal pulling to the left, this tensile member must be pulling to the right. If it's pulling on the joint, then the joint is pulling back on it, which creates a state of tension of magnitude 11.33p. So to come back to this joint, we just said the upward force of 8.5p and a downward force of 1p leaves a net upward force of 7.5p. This member has to be pulling down with a vertical component of 7.5p, and 4 thirds times that gives 10p, and then of course 5 thirds times it gives 12.5p. Now we need to finish resolving this joint uh, in terms of horizontals. We have this member pushing to the right on the joint with an 11.33p force. This member is pulling to the right with a 10p force. So those two horizontal components are reinforcing each other. They're both in the same direction. We will add them together and we get 21.33, which will be the force that this member has to be pushing back with in order to keep that joint in equilibrium. So we've now resolved everything at this joint. We can't resolve this joint directly because there are too many unknowns, but we can jump down here and again, we have one vertical, one horizontal, which allows us to completely resolve this joint quickly. And we're gonna do that first looking at the verticals. We see there's a vertical component upward due to the force of this diagonal. That component is 7.5 P. This member therefore has to be pushing down with a 7.5p force, and that takes care of the equilibrium of this joint relative to vertical forces. 
The fact that this member is pushing down on the joint means the joint is pushing back on the member, which means the member is in a state of compression and is pushing upward on this joint and pushing downward on that one. We now need to resolve the horizontal forces. Uh, you'll notice we have an 11.33 force to the left due to the tension in this bottom cord. We also have a 10p force to the left due to the horizontal component in this diagonal. They are both in the same direction. We therefore add them together and we get 21.33p to the left due to this force plus that force. This, this uh, cord force then has to equilibrate that. So we indicate a 21.33p force to the right uh, on this joint due to this member. If the member is pulling on the joint, that means the joint is pulling back on the member, which means the member is in tension, and it is therefore pulling on both these joints. Now we can jump up to this joint and resolve the verticals. We see that we have a 7.5p force up due to this member, a 1p force that's applied force downward, uh, which is offsetting part of that, that's a net upward force of 6.5p, which means this diagonal has to be pulling down with a vertical component of 6.5. By our proportions, we multiply that times 4 thirds to get this horizontal component. And now we can go resolve this joint relative to horizontal forces. So this member is pushing to the right with a 21.33p force. This member is pulling to the right with an 8.67p horizontal component. When we add those two together, we get 30p. And this member is the only member that can equilibrate that. So if both those forces are conspiring together to create a 30p force to the right on this joint, then this member must be exerting a 30p force to the left on the joint. In other words, it's pushing on the joint, the joint is pushing back on the member, that puts the member in a state of compression, and that force is transferred through to this joint here. Now we can jump down to this joint and resolve some forces. Um, the vertical component of this diagonal is 6.5. This member has to equilibrate that by pushing down on the joint because the diagonal is pulling up. So this member is pushing down on the joint. The joint is pushing back on the member with a 6.5p force, which is putting the member in compression. And that force is being transferred through up to this joint. Now we can resolve the horizontal forces right here. Um, again, we have this member pulling to the left with 21 point 33p, and this diagonal is pulling to the left with this force, 8.67p. When we add those two together, since they're both to the left, we get 30p. This member has to equilibrate that by pulling on the joint. The fact that it's pulling on the joint means the joint's pulling back on it, which is creating a state of tension in that member, and that force is getting transferred through to this joint. Now we can jump up to this joint and resolve the verticals. We have a 6.5p up, a 1p down, which is a net 5.5p up. This member has to be pulling down with a vertical component of 5.5p. We multiply that by 4 thirds to get the horizontal component, which is 7.33. Now we have to resolve this joint relative to horizontal forces. We have a 30p force to the right due to this member pushing on that joint. We have a 7.33 horizontal component due to this member pulling to the right on the joint. That's a net force to the right of 37.33p. The only member that can equilibrate that is this one. It has to be pushing back with a 37.33p force. Now we have one more joint to resolve here, or this is as far as we'll go and you can work the rest of it out. 
or check the rest of the solution in the book, but we are going to go resolve the vertical force at that joint, and we see that this member has to be pushing down with 5.5 P force to resist the upward pull of the vertical component of this diagonal force on the joint. This is the solution. Uh, this is the center line of the truss. As usual, we have this vertical member at the center of this even number of bays, symmetric, simple span truss. Uh, this little vertical element is like a column that absorbs the load, the supplied load P at this point. And we get the expected symmetry here that the vertical component of this diagonal is 0.5 and the vertical component of that diagonal is 0.5 which is just what's necessary to equilibrate the vertical force that's being transferred down through uh, this vertical member and not only do those two things have to add up to that 1p force but they need to be symmetric and they are so we're pretty happy with the web members um, the force pattern seems to be exactly what we expect. We have a 0.5p vertical, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, and so forth, um, where we uh, satisfy our equilibrium condition at the center. What we're not totally sure of are the chord forces, and so again, we're going to do our method of sections as a check. We're drawing uh, the truss, and in this case, we sliced through the bay just to the right of the symmetry line. So this is the center of the truss. Um, we could slice through this bay, or we can slice through that one. It's totally arbitrary, and we just picked one. Then we're going to take the moments about Q2, which is this point. D and T both go have a line of action passing through that point. They contribute nothing to the moment equation. So we'll start with this force, which is tending to produce a clockwise moment about point Q2. Um, it's, so we put a plus sign on it for a clockwise moment. The magnitude of the force is 9P. The lever arm is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, from the point about which you're calculating the moments to the line of action of this 9P force and each of these bays is 12 feet, so the lever arm is 9 bays times 12 foot per bay. And then from this force, we're tending to create counterclockwise motion about Q2, so it's a negative moment. We put a minus sign. The magnitude of the force is 0.5p. Again, the lever arm is 9 bays times 12 foot per bay. Finally, or excuse me, next we have this 9P force tending to produce counterclockwise motion. So we put a minus sign on it. The magnitude of the force is 9P. The lever arm is 1, 2, 3, 4 bays from the line of action of the member to the point about which we're calculating the moment. So in other words, 4 times 12 feet per bay. And finally, C is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment. So we put a minus sign in front of it, C for the magnitude, and then the lever arm between the line of action of C and the point about which we're calculating moments, that lever arm is 9 feet. So we multiply all these numbers together and we come out with 54P, which is what we got for our solution at the center of our truss. That concludes our video on the analysis of parallel cord trusses with rectangular bays.